Thank you, Pastor James. I appreciate that. Good evening. How's everybody tonight? Glad to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Amen. I'm glad to see you folks. Y'all be praying for the Snyders. They are on the road. Well, I guess I suppose they're probably where they're going to be. So pray for them as they are away for until, I'm not sure when they're coming back, Sunday, I believe. But uh, be praying for them. The Lord's good, isn't he? And uh, so uh, let's grab our Bibles tonight and turn with me, if you would, to the book of the Gospel of John, chapter number four. The Gospel of John, chapter number four. And uh, we're going to read one verse tonight as we take off on our, on our look uh, at the study of God's Word tonight. John chapter 4, we're going to be reading verse number 24. Where Jesus says, God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Years ago, I don't know if you guys remember this guy or not, but I vaguely do. Years ago, a comedian by the name of Flip Wilson uh, featured a character on his show by the name of Reverend Leroy. Reverend Leroy was the pastor of the church of what's happening now. Now, back then, no one, <laughs> no one really took Reverend Leroy seriously. But if the truth be told, the evangelical church today is swarming with Reverend Leroy's. It seems that nothing in evangelicalism today is too profane or too outrageous to put a Christian label on it. In the 1990s, there appeared an article in the Los Angeles Times Magazine about a church, I'm not sure if this was the title, but the topic of the column was the church that was seeking relevancy. The pastor of this church, according to the article, was a major fan of country music. And he distributed flyers for his church services, advertising the services as, quote, God's country good time hour, end quote. The flyers promised, quote, line dancing following the worship service. Isn't that, isn't that wonderful? According to the article, quote, the pastor is dancing too. Now, can y'all can y'all imagine me busting the move? The pastor is dancing too, decked out in Wrangler boots and Levi's. And the article went on to describe the typical Sunday morning. Quote, members listen to sermons whose topics include the pastor's 1970 Ford pickup truck and Christian sex, rated R because of irrelevance, respect, and relationship. The article goes on to say, after the service, they dance to a band called, what else? The Honky Tonk Angels. And the article said that attendance has been steadily rising. You know, it seems to me, folks, that in a lot of evangelical churches, the Holy Spirit is not the model of the church, but P.T. Barnum is the, is the model for, the, for many churches across America today. And the point of the study that we're doing together on worship is to call God's people back to the, to the biblical nature of worship. To see worship from really a biblical, not an emotional viewpoint. How then shall we worship? And we will see worship in four main headings, and they all have to do with the Scripture. First, we're going to see the structure of Scripture on true worship. Second, we're going to see the seat of Scripture on true worship. Third, we're going to see the sufficiency of Scripture on true worship. And fourth, we're going to see the study of Scripture on true worship. And what we're going to see, folks, Lord willing, in this study, is that all true worship comes back first to a biblical understanding of worship. Number one, let's look at the structure of Scripture on true worship. We learn very clearly from the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ 
what is, in fact, the structure of true worship. Again, looking at our same verse in John, John chapter 4, verse 24, where again Jesus says, God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Worship according to Jesus Christ, church, begins with truth. And the point of the passage is that there are two ways, folks, that a believer engages in true worship. The believer must, first of all, worship God in spirit. And the word spirit there is not speaking about the Holy Spirit, but it is speaking about the inward part of the man. It is speaking about the heart of the man. Listen, folks, true worship for a Christian is not just outward conformity to a religious ritual. It's not just the adherence to a list of rules and regulations. True worship must start, folks, with the confirmation or the conforming or the transformation of the person on the inside. True worship starts with a proper heart attitude. That's where it starts. Because listen, any outward conformity is short-lived, isn't it? If there's outward conformity, but there is not inward change in the heart, whatever you may try to be conforming yourself to is going to be short-lived. There must be confirmation in the heart. And that's what Jesus meant when He said, they that truly worship God are worshiping God, first of all, in spirit. We first of all worship God from our hearts, from our internal person, from who we are inside, our inward parts. That's where worship starts. And so when someone asks me what is the structure of Scripture on worship, Scripture tells us you worship in spirit. You worship in the inward man. Worship begins at the heart. But it doesn't stop there, folks. True worship doesn't stop with the inward person. True worship continues, Jesus said in verse 24, with what? Truth. We not only worship God in spirit, but we worship God in truth. And that refers to the fact that true worship, church, must be in constant adherence to what is the revealed Word of God. We must be conscious of every aspect of our, wor- of our worship. The music, the preaching, the praying, and even the offering that we give is worship that is rendered to God. And therefore, we must realize that worship is the true ultimate priority of the church and therefore is truly the ultimate priority of the Christian The ultimate priority of Emmanuel Baptist Church and the ultimate priority of the believers that make up Emmanuel Baptist Church is not public relations. It is not recreation. It is not social activities. There's not anything necessarily wrong with any one of those things. There's nothing wrong with having a good public relations. In other words, there's nothing wrong with people thinking well of you. Uh, There's nothing wrong with the people thinking well of the church being drawn to the church, not because you've compromised, but being drawn to you and being drawn to the church because of your testimony for Christ. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with recreation. There's nothing wrong with having fun. There's nothing wrong with the church getting together and having a softball game, is it? Nothing wrong with the church getting together having an ice cream social that we're going to do at the end of the month. Nothing wrong with getting together and having a, 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 what are we calling it, a sprinkle day that we're going to have in the middle of the month. Nothing wrong with that where everybody comes to church and gets wet. If you don't want to get, if you don't want to get wet, stay home. No, you can come and have fun. Just people, tell people you, you, you're scared of drowning. Nothing wrong with those things. Nothing wrong with social activities. I'm a member of, some social activities. I'm a chaplain of the Louisa County Sheriff's Department. That's a social activity. Nothing wrong with those things. But we must realize that the ultimate priority of the church, the ultimate priority of every person that makes up the church, is worship. Worship, first of all, from the heart. And and worship as it is revealed in the Scripture. And it has absolutely, folks, nothing to do with boosting attendance figures. That is not true worship. 
Our ultimate priority is not building the largest church. I know a pastor who used to pastor in this area. He said that his goal was, quote, to build the largest church in Louisa County. That's not the goal of the church. Jesus didn't build the largest church when he was on earth. He started with how many people? Twelve. Really, eleven, but twelve. Eleven real followers, but twelve people. The job of the church is not to build a big building. It's not to build a big attendance. Now, if God gives you big numbers and big buildings, by His grace and fine. But your ultimate priority is worship, church. We must always keep in mind that in relation to our worship, the only reliable and sufficient worship manual is the Scripture. Your worship guide is not what works. Okay? It's not what works. That's a pragmatic approach. And prag pragmatism is the philosophy that basically says that worth or value is dependent upon the response. If you get a positive response, then that action is valuable. If you get a negative response, then that action is invaluable or not valuable at all. Well, that's the exact opposite of Paul. what Paul said in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 1, isn't it? That we've been going through the book of 1 Corinthians on Sunday night, and what did we learn in the first chapter of 1 Corinthians? That God has chosen how people, how did people view preaching? Foolishness. That's not a positive response. But God says that's what He is, Paul says that's what God has chosen to use to save those that are lost. And if God desires us, which He does, to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And if worship is something that is offered to God, we saw that last week, is that it is, 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 it is akin to a burnt offering. And what was, the, what was the identification or the practice of the burnt offering? God took it all. And in the list of all the offerings in the Old Testament, the burnt offering is always at the top of the list because it always starts there, meaning what? True worship always begins, folks, with us giving our whole selves to God. And until we give our whole self to God, body, soul, mind, and heart, and abilities, we'll never truly worship God the way that God wants us to. Since God wants us to worship Him, and in fact commands us to worship Him in spirit and in truth, and since all worship is an offering to God, is not just a show that we put on for the benefit of the congregation. Every aspect of our worship must be pleasing to God. And church, listen, it must be in harmony with the Word of God. And we must understand that the structure of Scripture on true worship, is that our worship, church, must be from the heart. Must be from the inside of who we are, based on the revealed Word of God. There needs to be a renewed emphasis in our churches. A heightened emphasis, if you will, on worship and a commitment to the centrality of Scripture. How many times have you known a person that was in church or that was in some type of service and somebody was singing or, or, or what have you, and, and I remember some years ago I was sitting in a church service, don't remember why I was there, but I was by myself, and I was sitting next to a young lady and somebody got up to sing, and, uh, and the person looked over me after they got through singing and they said to me, Wow, the Holy Spirit is really in this place tonight, isn't it? Well, I would have agreed with her except for one problem. The song that was being sang was unbiblical. And listen, just because your emotions may get stirred up by music, listen, if the song that's being sung is unscriptural, the Holy Spirit isn't anywhere near that one. Your emotions may be in play, your emotions may be turning, but the Holy Spirit isn't anywhere near a song that's unscriptural. Folks, listen, the scriptural, the structure of scripture on true worship is true worship, as Jesus said in John 4, 24, true worship is starts from the inside, starts with the heart, starts with you giving your whole self to God and worship is only as is revealed in the word of God. Those that worship him, Jesus said, must worship in spirit and truth. 
Let's worship in spirit and truth. Number two, not only do we see the structure of Scripture on true worship, but we see the seat of Scripture on true worship. The absolute power is the seat or bedrock of Scripture. The, the most powerful relation to worship is found in the Psalms. Psalm 19, one of my favorite Psalms. Psalm 19, the, the psalmist said, beginning in verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold. Yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honey comb. And the point of the passage, quite simply, folks, is that Scripture is wholly sufficient to meet every need of the human soul. And that is what makes the Scripture the seat of all worship. You know, we live in a day where we want to gauge our worship on what gets us emotionally stirred up, what gets us emotionally excited. You know, I, I realize that not every sermon that I've ever preached, and it's, and it's that way on purpose, because God doesn't intend it to be that way, I realize that not every sermon that I preach gets you all emotionally stirred up, gets you all hot and bothered, and gets you all turned up and ready to go charge hell with the water pistol. I realize that. Okay, And it's that way on purpose. I don't seek to do that. I seek to give you the whole counsel of God and then let the Holy Spirit do with the Word of God what He's going to do. I don't have to add me because when I add me, we've messed up. The last thing you want to see up here, even though you like my shirt, the last thing you want to see up here is me. And I realize that not every sermon gets emotionally stirred up. Not every song gets you emotionally stirred up. In fact, there are some songs I just don't like. And so it doesn't always get us emotionally stirred up. And it's not supposed to, folks, because the Word of God is the, is the seat. It is the bedrock of what determines how we worship. Because listen, it is the truth of Scripture that restores a sin-damaged soul, isn't it? It is the truth of Scripture that can cheer the downcast heart. It is the truth of Scripture that can bring spiritual enlightenment. And the Bible sums up everything we need to know about truth and righteousness in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 17 when it says about the Word of God that the Word of God is inspired that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto what? All good works. And we must view Scripture, church, as the only source that we turn to for infallible truth. Your emotions are not what dictates truth. Your emotions are not what dictate worship. It is the Scripture. Some years ago, I was thumbing through the, the channels on the cable network television, and I came across a very popular religious broadcast. And I recognized the people that were being interviewed. And the man doing the interview said to the, the man had being interviewed, said to the couple, I was born in 1929. My life verse is Matthew 19.29. And Matthew 19.29 says, With man this is impossible, but with God everything, all things are possible. Oh, well they just went giddy over that. Oh, how wonderful, how wonderful. Well, I was born in 1934. I wonder what my verse, life verse is. Well, he found out that Matthew doesn't have 34 verses in chapter 13. Well, what about... Mark, no. So they went to Luke. And in Luke 13, 34, it says, the, the, the host read it and said, Behold, I have need of him. Oh, that is wonderful, wonderful, man. That's my life verses. The Lord has need of me. 
Then his wife, who was sitting beside him, was the one that read the verse, says, uh, wait a minute, uh, that verse is speaking about a donkey. And I thought to myself, well, the shoe fits. And the point is, folks, is that your emotion and your little numbers game doesn't determine truth. It doesn't determine what true worship is. The Word of God is the seat, is the bedrock, is the authority of true worship. Number three, we see the structure of Scripture on true worship. We see the seat of Scripture on true worship. And number three, we see the sufficiency of Scripture on true worship. How exactly does the sufficiency of Scripture, folks, apply to worship? How does the sufficiency of Scripture apply to worship? Now, the Reformers answered that question by applying the principles of sola scriptura, which means is Latin for Scripture alone, to worship in a tenet that they called the regulative principle. The regulative principle. John Calvin, one of the Reformers' loudest voices, said of the regulative principle, quote, We may not adopt and devise in worship which seems for to ourselves, but look to the injunctions of Him who alone is entitled to prescribe. Therefore, if we would have Him approve our worship, this rule which He everywhere enforces with the utmost strictness must be carefully observed. God disapproves of all modes of worship not expressly sanctioned by His Word. In other words, the Reformers incorporated the regulative principle that basically said this, if the, Bible doesn't speak in, if the Bible doesn't speak in approval of it, it's speaking against it. If the Bible is silent about it, the Bible is against it. Because the minds of the Reformers were, if God was for it, then He would speak for it. An English contemporary of John Calvin, uh, John Hooper stated it this way, nothing shall be, should be used in the church which is not expressed in the Word, or does not have the Word of God to support it. Now, evangelicals, you and I would do well to recover the spiritual heritage of sola scriptura as it applies to worship and church leadership. Because when churches do not apply the teachings of Scripture in their worship, then the worship is all over the place, isn't it? Worship is all over the place if we don't apply the principles of worship that the Scripture teaches. On the one hand, folks, you have almost a circus atmosphere where pragmatic methods are used to boost attendance, yet it trivializes that which is holy. When I was in Bible college, I was in a church one Sunday evening, and they had a bunch of children saved from the bus ministry that, that morning, and they were going to baptize those children, the children that got saved that night. And most of them, it looked like, probably came back that night to get baptized. And so we went through the service, and they were having the baptism at the end of the service. And as we prepared for the baptism, they had a, a, a curtain over top of the baptistry. And as we got to prepare for the baptism, you could hear all kinds of commotions and balloons popping and, and, and noisemakers going on in the back of the, back of the church. And when the curtains opened, the pastor didn't preach that night. A guest speaker was there, which is probably why I was there. And when the curtains opened and the pastor was in there to baptize, he was dressed as a clown. He was dressed as a clown. In the Baptist church, dressed as a clown, baptizing these wild, zany children with balloons and noisemakers. Now, was the church packed out that night? Oh, you better believe it was. You better believe it was. But folks, listen, the church of Jesus Christ better get back to applying biblical principles to worship. Because you, it's a, in some of these places, like I was just telling you about, it's a circus. I mean, P.T. Barnum should get a job there. Because it's a circus. But it trivializes that which is holy. But then on the other hand, you have those people that are abandoning simple forms of worship in favor of high church formation. And still there are others that are going, uh, going to opt for a brand of sheer mysticism that is turbulent, emotional, and devoid of really any rational sense. 
And you see that played out in the evidence of the uh, what was called the, the Lakeland Revival and the Sons of Thunder, and whose trademark is acting tipsy and labeling that which is holy as drunken glory. Go ahead and play the video. There was a spirit there. And unfortunately, folks, that's not the exception. That's the norm in many, many churches. Now, that guy was high on something when he got in the pulpit. I'm not sure what. But that is probably, and I've watched a lot, and I've shared a lot with you over the years, but that is probably one of the most heretical displays of blaming the Holy Spirit for anything. And they call that the drunken glory. Sheer mysticism. Pretty close to what I might want to call demon possession but nothing having to do with worshiping in spirit and in truth. Now, for lack of a better term, you and I don't run in circles or participate in circles of which that type of stuff goes on. But I can tell you one thing right now, folks. You may be sitting in a Baptist church, and if the worship of that Baptist church is not in accordance to the Word of God, it is just as blasphemous as that was. That's why Jesus says, they that worship must worship in spirit and in truth. People in these movements, I don't know if you can hear it in the background, people in this, these movements laugh uncontrollably. They bark like dogs. They roar like lions. I've even heard them cluck like chickens. They jump, they run, and they land on the floor, and they, they have all these type of convulsions going on, and they say they're being filled with the Holy Spirit, and they blame God for that. Again, folks, that's not the type of worship that you and I participate in, and that's not the type of worship that you and I practice and, and see on a day-to-day, -day, on a week-to-week on a -week basis. But I wonder how much of our worship God, God sees as stench in His nostrils because we haven't first given of ourselves to Him first. You see, folks, it's not getting in the pulpit high on something and talking about a drunken glory and blaming God for it that is much of an offense as the Bible-believing Christian who says they're engaging in worship of God while they're holding a grudge against somebody else. That type of incense that we talked about last week, that type of incense that rises to the nostrils of God stinks. And just like the burnt offering, we must give of ourselves first if we're going to worship God in spirit and in truth. And the sufficiency of Scripture ought to spur us, really folks, to keep reforming our churches to regulate sola scriptura as the basis of what regulates our worship. What does the Word of God say? 
Charles Spurgeon, for example, used the regulative worship or the regulative principle in his church to rule out any use of musical instruments. Sorry, James. In fact, in the Metropolitan Tabernacle, Charles Spurgeon would not allow an organ in his church because he believed there was no biblical warrant for instruments in Christian worship. When I told James today, I said when Charles Spurgeon wrote the Treasury of David, which is his commentary on all the psalm, he must have skipped over Psalm 150. Because I find in Psalm 150 a clear and biblical warrant for musical instruments. Now, it's, I don't think it's necessarily helpful to, dis, to dispute in those minor points of musical instruments in a church during worship. But, I just, but just so you know, Psalm 150 says, Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in the firmament of His power. Praise Him for His mighty acts. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with the sound of a trumpet. With the, praise Him with the psaltery and harp. Praise Him with the timbrel and dance. Praise Him with stringed instruments. And what? Sorry, Chuck. Praise Him upon the loud cymbals. Praise Him upon the high-sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. So my concern for the church is not whether or not we sing with musical instruments or we sing a cappella. Whether you sing as a choir or whether we have solos, I'm not interested in debating those things. I'm not interested in debating the fact that, that the only approved instrument in the church is a piano or an organ. Because clearly, David in Psalm 150, there were all kinds of musical instruments, including percussions. So don't you walk up into a church that has a set of drums on the platforms that, oh, this is one of those churches. Let me tell you something. I've seen a piano used for the glory of Satan, just like I've seen a set of drums used for the glory of Satan. And I've seen a piano used for the glory of God just like I've seen the set of drums used for the glory of God. I'm just saying be careful. Be careful of your judgment, your assessment on churches that have that. I'm just saying be careful. Because what I am concerned with is this, that contemporary churches have abandoned sola scriptura as the regulative principle. And what that does, folks, is that opens the door of the churches to some of the most grossest imaginable abuses including what is known as, quote, honky-tonk church. I've told you many times, there was a church in, in, this, in this county 15, 20 years ago that in the auditorium of the church took out all the chairs, brought in a wrestling ring, and had professional wrestlers in the sanctuary of the church. And it turns out, folks, to be a carnival sideshow atmosphere. Think, for, think with me for a moment if the church of Jesus Christ took sola scriptura seriously. What would happen? And I believe that if this happens, I believe four biblical guidelines would take place. First of all, the churches would preach the Word. The churches would preach the Word. Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2, he says, Timothy, preach the word. Be instant or be ready in season, out of season. And, here's the, and here, is the, here is the purpose of preaching, to reprove, to rebuke, to exhort. The purpose of preaching is to tell people that they're wrong. Not that I say that you're wrong, but that the word of God says that you're wrong. But not only is the purpose of preaching to tell people that they're wrong, but the purpose of preaching is to tell them how to make it right. And then he goes on, but it is also used to what? Exhort. With patience. And what? Doctrine. Preaching. Worship. According to the Scriptures, should always be doctrinal. Doctrinal. 
That's why I love the new hymns that James is implementing on Sunday morning because they are so doctrinally rich. Worship must be doctrinal if it's going to be biblical, right? It can't be emotional. It must be doctrinal. And clearly, this was the heart of Timothy's personal ministry. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and prayers. The ministry, folks, of the Word was so vital. This is probably, Jana, one of my favorite passages in the book of Acts. The Word of God, the ministry of the Word was so vital to the church that one time, Paul preached past midnight. And nobody left. Only one backslider fell asleep and fell out of the window. His name was Eutychus. And he must have been a backslider. That's why he was sitting in the window anyway. Easy escape. I'm kidding. Acts chapter 20, verse 7. And upon the first day of the week, so we're talking about what day of the week? This is the Lord's Day. We're talking about Sunday. And I believe Paul probably started early. Let's say 6 a.m. and preached till after midnight. Boy, he was getting it. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow. And he preached and he continued his speech until midnight. He was getting ready to leave. He said, I need to unload to these people everything that I can. You know, there have been more than one time my wife has looked at me after a Sunday morning service and she says, Michael, you don't have to tell them everything that you know in one service. Well, Paul thought he had to. I'm going to leave. I don't know when I'm going to be back. So he held them until midnight. And they listen and look in the verse 8. And there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together. Well, here you've got a group of people in the church that the Word of God is so vital to them that the sufficiency of the Word is so vital that Paul preaches till midnight. Now, I don't know when he started, but I don't care when he started. By the time midnight comes around, everybody's tired. But here you've got a people that the Bible was so vital to them that they were sitting around listening to a man preach until after midnight. And in today's churches, you get the preacher gets a hard time if he preaches till 12.05. Ministry of the Word must be such a vital part of church life and is such, a, was, is such a vital part of the early church's life that before any man would be qualified to be an elder, he had to be improved to be skilled in the Word. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2, it says, given the qualifications of an elder, it says at the end of the verse, he must be able to teach. Same thing in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 24. It says that the, that the servant of the Lord must be able to teach. And in Titus chapter 1 verse 9, holding fast the faithful word as he had been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convince the gainsayer. We need, you need to be very vital. This church needs to be very sure that preaching has the dominant feature in every part of the worship service. You know, many people see worship and preaching as two distinct aspects of church service, as if preaching has nothing to do with worship and vice versa. But preaching church is the platform on which all genuine worship is built. John Stott said, Word and worship belong indissolubly together. All worship is an intelligent and loving response to the revelation of God. The whole church service, whole church service, folks, should revolve around the ministry of the Word. Yes, we have music. Yes, we have fellowship. But listen, the whole church service must revolve around the ministry of the Word. I get real bothered when I'm, in, when I'm preaching and people have been able to sit still all throughout, the, all throughout the worship and the fellowship time, but the moment the Word of God gets preached, oh, I've got to go to the bathroom. 
Oh, i got to get some fresh air. Listen, the Word of God needs to be, the, the church services rather needs to revolve around the ministry of the Word. Either as uh, preparatory or as a response to the message of Scripture. And worship that does not include an in-depth exposition of the Word is of questionable value. Not only would the, would the church that took solo scriptura seriously preach the word, but it also edify the flock. All ministry in the concept of the church, folks, should be sort some type of edifying ministry. We must build up one another, not just stir the emotions. Because worship should engage the intellect as well as the emotions. Worship should be passionate heartfelt and moving. But true worship church never turns off the mind. True worship merges from a heart and mind in a response of pure adoration that is based upon what God has revealed about Himself and worship in Scripture. Now music may sometimes stir us by the sheer beauty of its sound, but that's not necessarily worship. And I'm not saying you're not engaging in worship through music, but that's not necessarily worship. Because genuine worship, folks, is a response to divine truth. Which is one of the reasons why they named our podcast Divine Truth. Because all worship is a response to divine truth. Because true worship only arises out of an understanding of His law, His righteousness, His mercy, and who He is. Real worship acknowledges God as He has revealed Himself in His Word. And real worship means ascribing glory to Him because of those truths. Now for a lot of people sitting in some churches today, Tonight, this weekend, not necessarily you, because you've been, you've been together for a long time, but for some people sitting in churches, this type of worship is odd. Oh, that's not worship, that's boring. You know, bring up grandma, let's go back to church with grandma. But no, this is the biblical form of worship, isn't it? And it all starts with what? Worshiping in spirit and truth. Our worship form must be based upon what the Word of God says. There is certainly no place in the corporate worship of the church, folks, for any kind of frivolous, shallow, giddy kind of atmosphere that is often prevalent in the uh, relevant postmodern comedy club cultures. There must be reverence and awe. In other words, we need, to, we need to have a solemn sense of honor as we perceive the majesty of God. And many have gone away from the proper focus being on the Word to a more entertaining, emotional-only style, they say, in order to reach the lost. You know, Pastor, you're not going to get unsaved people in here by, uh, by the type of worship you're describing. We need to have big music. We need to have big programs. We need to have big features in order to, in order to get people in here so they can hear the Gospel. But folks, you've been with me long enough to know what I think, what I believe the Bible teaches is that the point of corporate worship is not ever evangelism, but is the edification of the saints. You and I don't meet here three times a week for evangelism. We meet here for the edification of one another. The writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 10, for example, when he talked about in verse 25 of not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, what did he say in verse 24? He said, Come together for why? To edify one another or to encourage one another to love and good works. He did not say you assemble together to evangelize the lost. You assemble together to encourage one another. Notice what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 23. I got 30 seconds. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place and all speak in tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or what? 
What was Paul saying? Listen, if the whole church has gotten together and an unbeliever just happens to come by. Now again, he's talking about the context of the proper use of the, of the, of the gift of tongues. And he's saying, if you're all meeting together and speaking in tongues, make sure that you're doing it in a way that if an unbeliever just happens to come by, he won't think you're crazy. But I think Paul's language there is rather telling. That when you all come together, and then an unbeliever just, just comes by. Evangelism takes place, folks, in the context of everyday life. We gather for worship. We scatter for evangelism. Okay? We gather for worship. We scatter for evangelism. When a church makes its meetings all evangelistic, believers lose the opportunity to grow, to be edified, and to worship. And when the church comes together on the Lord's Day, it is no time, church, to entertain the loss. It's not a time to, to make our church services pliable to make the unsaved people feel comfortable. Listen, I don't want unsaved people to feel comfortable here. I want them to feel welcome, but I don't want them to feel comfortable here. Because if an unsaved person comes in here who's dead in trespasses and sins, and he feels absolutely at home here in what we're doing, something is wrong in what we're doing. I, again, I want them to feel welcome. But not comfortable. Not comfortable. And when churches come together on the Lord's Day, and it's listen, it's no time to entertain the loss. It's not even a time to amuse the believers or otherwise go after their felt needs in order to gain attendance. Notice what Jesus says. A wonderful example, and I'm going to end with this, that Jesus gives in Luke 10. And Jesus answered and said unto her, remember this is a time where Jesus went over to the house of Mary and Martha for, for dinner. And Martha's running around doing all this type of work, getting everything prepared. You know, she's getting the table set. She's you know, getting, making sure Jesus' feet are washed and just making sure dinner's perfect because the Master's here. And where's Mary, her sister? Just sitting down to feed of Jesus. Well, Martha gets to complaining about it. Say, Lord, tell that lazy bum, sister of mine, to get up and help me. I don't know about you, but that would have been my response to Jesus about Mary. I'm sure I've said that about my sister before. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful or anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. And the point is, church, is that Mary's worship had an internal significance, whereas all that Martha's busy activity meant nothing beyond that particular afternoon. When that day was done, what Martha had, had done was going to be forgotten. But what Mary was doing had eternal significance. And church, listen, when we come together every service, we need to make sure that what we're doing has eternal significance because if all we're doing here is entertaining the lost and amusing the believers, all that's going to be for naught and forgotten and doesn't have any eternal significance. And our Lord is teaching that worship is one of the essential activities that must take precedence over every other activity of life. We who love Christ and believe His Word, that it is true, should not dare accommodate our worship to the styles and preferences of an unbelieving world. And to not do that, we need to allow Scripture alone to regulate our worship. So the title of the message tonight was a question, how shall we then worship? The answer, Scripture alone dictates our worship. Not what works, not what's popular, not what's emotional steering, but Scripture alone dictates our worship. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you tonight for your truth. Lord, help us to.
understand what it is you're saying to us tonight. We thank you, Father, for your grace and your mercy. And we pray, Father God, that you would continue to speak to our hearts about the nature of true worship. Help us, Father, to look to your truth for all that we need in life and godliness and true worship in the church. We praise you, Father, and we thank you. In Christ's name, amen.